guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we build a better future. Today we got somebody who's trying to do that and get us there in the process, Jarrett Walker on the program. Jarrett, thanks for coming. Hey, thanks, Matt. Glad to be here. I wanted to start off with a controversial statement that most people would get a little bit upset with, but I think is something you hold, and that's driverless cars will make the traffic problem worse. Yes, that's true. Walk me through the logic. Sure. Um, First of all, a driverless car is just a car. It's going to take the same amount of space as any other car. Um, you're going to be able in this, in the hypothetical world of level five driverless cars, which is what we're talking about, that's cars that do not need a human being to be paying attention for any purpose. Um, you're going in, in that hypothetical future, you're going to be able to get in your car and go somewhere and it will require no effort on your part. So you can read the newspaper while you're going somewhere, okay? This will trigger a process known as induced demand. And induced demand is the biological fact that we will we tend to do things more if they are easier, okay? Um, an organ, any organism, has the problem of running a balance sheet where it is trying to get resources it needs and it's trying to spend fewer resources than it's going to get. That's how an organism stays alive. And so um, we're programmed to do things in ways that take less energy. And we're more likely to do something where an animal's more likely to get a resource if it, if it, if it can be done more easily. The reason I go into biology is to just emphasize how obvious this is, how little data you need to understand this. Induced demand means if it is easier to go places by car, we will use cars more. And that is how we will end up with more traffic. Um, there's no way around it. It's, it's, it's an inevitable part of, of how we as organisms function. Yeah, you buy way more stuff when you have Amazon than you do if you have to go to a exactly. mall. Exactly. And we have all sorts of examples of where, you know, um, you know, treatments for various uh, problems have caused people to take more risks that would cause the problems. You know, it's all that sort of thing. How do we how do we deal with that? So I feel like most of the folks that are working on driverless cars don't think about these type of implications and they're trying their best to solve a big problem. Right. They've defined a, a technological problem. And the problem is that underneath it is that the problem is not just technological. The problem is biological. The problem is how various technologies affect us and cause us to behave. So um, the, the, the real point of this is that we ha is that getting excited about technology is often a way of, of distracting ourselves from thinking about the actual problems before us. In an urban context, in a city, or even in a moderately dense suburban area, the defining problem of the city is that there is not very much space per person. That's what a city is. It's a lot of people and not very much space, right? So the, so the way to get places in cities in a way that lets everyone else get in places in cities, the core problem is not whether we're driving or whether a machine is driving. The core problem is how much space we're taking and whether, given the space we're taking, there's enough space for everyone else. That's the problem of cars in cities. The problem of cars in cities is that because there is not room for everyone to carry around three empty seats, um, driving a car in a city means you are taking space away from other people, right? Um, whether that's because you get stuck in traffic and therefore you're literally blocking someone behind you from getting where they're going, um, or whether it's simply that you're taking so much space that there isn't room for people to be pedestrians or cyclists or all those other things that you need people to do in order for them not to take too much space. So um, the problem of cities, the problem of transportation is a geometry problem, and no technology has ever changed a geometric fact. That's why you have to think about geometry and not just technology. What about the parking lot equation? All the say it's also right. It's also a geometry problem, right? So we're we're already experiencing we are, we're um, the way uh, autonomous cars are not really um, affecting parking. What's affecting parking is the idea of the shared ride the, or the car that you hail and you and use while you're using it 
and then let go of so that you don't have to park it. So that's something that's coming already, that's come already with Uber and Lyft. The, the proposal of Uber and Lyft to the city is that we will take less parking and we will generate more traffic. The idea of ride hailing, right, is that the vehicle comes to you, you ride it to where you're going, you don't have to park it because you just let go of it and it goes on and does something else. That'll be true whether it's an autonomous taxi or what we have now with a driver, same thing. So the if, so if you think about that, unlike the car that you drive, your own car that you drive to a destination, the Uber car won't take parking. So there is an overall reduction in parking demand, but there's an overall increase in traffic because unlike your car, the Uber car has to drive from where it dropped you off to where it picks the next person up. And all of that traffic, it's called deadheading, is new traffic generated by the shift of someone from driving their own car to using something like Uber. So the bottom line is shifting people from cars to ride hailing, to Uber or Lyft, is reducing parking demand and increasing traffic. Which makes ev everything's really an optimization problem. How Absolutely. Do we, how do we think about that as people, as cities? What does that look like going forward? I know you talk about the three problems of transportation. I think we could have a very clear conversation if we, if fewer people were in denial about the geometric facts, right? A lot of what technology marketing tries to do is get you excited, like all marketing, the goal is to get you excited so that you won't think clearly. <clears throat> and claims that some sort of transformation of the car, by which it is still a car, <laughs> that that protects you from the company of other people and lets you stay in your own pod with only people you want to be with, the notion that that is a solution to transportation in dense cities. Doesn't matter whether it's Uber, doesn't matter whether it's driverless, doesn't matter whether it's electric, none of that matters. The notion that that kind of vehicle that protects you from strangers, the notion that that has any future in a city as a mass way of getting around for most people is mathematically incoherent. And it's obviously incoherent because there simply isn't room in a city for all those cars. And if you stay focused on the geometric fact, the fact that there's a limit to the, a thing that we all know, which is that there's a limit to how many large things will fit in a small space, then you know everything you need to know about cars in a city. And then you understand that when we do drive a car into a city with our three empty seats, or when we let Uber drive us into the city, or we, when we let an autonomous car drive us around the city, we are taking more than our fair share of space, because space is scarce, and therefore we're having some sort of moral impact on other people, whether it's creating congestion, or threatening pedestrians, or making it hard for people to get around by other means, or whatever it is. You know, the moral reality of that arises from the geometric reality of that. And none of these technologies are changing that at all. Technology never changes geometry. But what about when you take that to its smallest scale, which would be scooters or super mini micro smart car pods? How right. Do you, how do you think about that equation? Because when you when you amplify it out, it certainly is getting better the smaller you get. But when is that good enough? Right. So a good question. So. If the problem is that lots of people need to get around inside a city and there is not enough space for them to all drive cars, there are three kinds of solution to that problem in my mind. And they're complementary. Um, for people who, uh, for people can travel using a vehicle that doesn't take much more space than their body. And that's what we call micromobility a scooter, a bicycle, right? You take not very much space in the city because you're using a vehicle that's very small. And as a result, there's room in the city for lots of those vehicles in a way that there's not room for lots of cars. However, micromobility has range limits. Relatively few people are going to use them for more than a few miles. Even in you know cycling paradise, the Netherlands, the overwhelming majority of cycling trips are less than a mile. So it's so micro mobility for you know like our warriors accepted micro mobility is mostly a short distance tool for longer distances the only solution then that works for lots of people is some form of high ridership high volume public transit 
the idea of public transit is that we is that lots of people get together in a vehicle so that collectively they are taking very little space per person as they travel. Rail, buses, ferries, all of those things designed to carry lots of people per vehicle is, is that sort of transit that helps solve that problem. The third thing, of course, is that if you really need to drive a car into a city or drive a delivery truck or whatever, or, or drive around as a mechanic with your tools, there is a price for that real estate that you are seizing by virtue of doing that. Because you're taking so much more than your fair share of space, there's a price for that. And there's a natural market price for that. And so road pricing is the third part of that. So all three of those things are compatible. In fact, the ideal solution really integrates all of them. And it, so as to create a properly priced system where people are, um, where people who take more than their share of fares, more than their fair share of space pay for that space. And as a result, there's the funding for the transit and the bike facilities and everything else you need so that everybody can get where they're going without running out of space. And in theory, you have a dynamic system to balance all of that. Um, yes. I mean, I, I think it's not. And, you know, a lot of interesting things are going on in the information technology space, which I think is, frankly, one of the most thoroughly exciting and constructive technology areas. It has far fewer downsides. Um, with, about how you organize, you know, tolling and information and all that. But the fundamental principle, the geometric principle, the thing that you know, the way you know that a large object won't fit in a small container is what really gives us the reality that it's it's those three things. It's, it's micromobility for short distances, it's transit for long distances, and for the few people who really need to use more space because they're carrying something or whatever, um, they need to pay more for that space. How do you think about ridership versus uh, coverage in terms of mass transit? So I can get lots of people using it and having busy transit, but I'm not going to get little Miss Ninny Nanny who lives out in the suburbs. It's hard in right. the, it's hard in the U.S. because we designed everything all wrong around the car. Right, right. So this is interesting. I um, <clears throat> um, I just started a project in Dallas. We're just now starting a network redesign project in Dallas, and there's already been a piece in in D Magazine about it. And you know the controversy is already about. I mean, the city of the inner city's perspective is, you know, we have lots of service needs that could fill buses, but the buses that could be full if they were running around in the inner city are, are instead out in the suburbs carrying five people, because of the way the suburbs are designed, the way the suburbs are designed makes high ridership transit difficult to, very difficult at best, uh, and sometimes impossible. Um, so the question becomes, given that a transit agency, in this case DART, which is across many cities in addition to Dallas, um, given that it's taking funding from the entire region, what is its obligation to the parts of the region that aren't really able to generate as much ridership as the inner city, but that are nevertheless paying for the service? And you know, to complicate it a little more, some of these suburban cities are genuinely trying to build more urban development forms. They're trying to fix their urban fabric to be more walkable, to be more oriented toward transit. But of course, they need transit for that to work. So, um, so that's just hard. And it's the sort of question that I help cities think about, but I won't answer for them. I won't tell them what to do about it, but I will help them frame the question and think about it. The, the geometric fact of transit, if you stop and think through it, and I've explained this online, you can Google our piece called the ridership coverage trade-off at humantransit.org, is that um, if you told a transit agency that their only goal was to maximize ridership, if that weren't actually the purpose, the transit agency would run very high frequency services in the dense inner city and out only along corridors where that, that were very dense and where there were lots of walkable development. They would not go to low density suburbs. They would not go to business parks. They would not go to, to low slung industrial areas because they because in pursuing ridership, they would be thinking like a business and a business chooses which markets it will enter. It doesn't feel obligated to go everywhere. So. Transit agencies don't do that entirely because they have a competing set of objectives that are opposite, and those are what I call the coverage objectives. 
people all over the transit agency service area think they're entitled to service. People all over the transit agency service area pay into the to the area. They have their own representatives on the board or the count or the county council or whatever who demand that service. What's more, we this is now worsened by the phenomenon of the suburbanization of poverty is more low income people are forced to move to less desirable places, which are now the car oriented places. Um, they're forced to live in land use patterns that make it expensive for transit to get to them. And so access to opportunity. Uh, and so the, 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 at that point, the justice agenda, the agenda or, or the agenda of simply leaving no one behind, um, leave no one behind is a very difficult thing to be against. So that's the other reason we do coverage. To put it more, or, or to put it more simply, if a transit agency goes out with a plan that cuts a lot of coverage service because it's permanently low ridership and spends that on high density urban service instead, people come out and scream that you're cutting them off and destroying their lives. And some of those people are right because they depend on those low ridership services. So my job is not to make that easy. My job is to make it clear when I'm working with when I'm working with a transit agency and when I'm working with their board and their constituency, because every community has to decide this for themselves, how they're going to strike that balance. But don't let anyone on either side of this question pretend that this is easy or obvious. It's a genuinely difficult problem. It goes to the whole question of what public transit is for. Should public transit be private or public or some combination of the two? How do you think about the ideal situation? Local government must control the planning of public transit because it's so intimately tied to the planning of other transportation infrastructure, and it's also so intimately tied to land use and development plan. Uh, it's disastrous for um, a government to, to control land use planning but not feel it has any control over transportation because the result of that is that governments don't think about transportation when they're doing land use planning. In, so it, there are plenty of opportunities for the private sector to be hired by transit authorities to run parts of the transit system. But um, I have worked in environments like Australia uh, where the uh, government basically just washed its hands of public transit and let private companies do wherever they want. And that's a mess. That's a mess. That doesn't work. Um, the private sector does not have this, the motive the private sector is not motivated to help create a great city. The private sector is not motivated to support the uh, plans and aspirations of the people of a city. The private sector just has the wrong motives. So you think a lot of these pushes to have Lyft and Uber essentially let the government outsource it because there's so much infrastructure that would have to go into public transit. You think these approaches to letting a public, uh, public company instead try to make a profit mode out of it is a bad idea. I was talking mostly about the experience in countries where even, you know, large scale public transit bus, you know, large scale bus transit that's high ridership has been outsourced to the public sector to the point of allowing to, to the private sector to the point of allowing private companies to plan it. That's a disaster. Um, the cl claims that a small vehicle product of any kind are capable of replacing most public transit are in addition to that geometrically ludicrous um, because the core issue is the efficient use of space trans uh, and because prior to automation we also need to use labor efficiently the key is the key to successful transit is getting lots of people into one vehicle with one driver and that's just the opposite of what uber and lifters and the micro transit people are selling they're, they're selling the idea that um, we should get lots of pe lots of people into little vehicles, which means lots of little vehicles, which means taking us back to all the same problems of cars. Some of the problems of cars, but much smaller. So you do eliminate a lot of the problems with micro transit, I think. At what least in it's, cities? Never mind. Tell me what you have in mind. Uh, what percentage of a city is taken up by cars? If you can have people instead parking on the outskirts of the cities and taking micro transit, you have way less congestion in the city because you have way smaller vehicles. You probably have less emissions because they're easier to make electric. You Hang on, microtransit as we understand it right now is not vehicles that are smaller than an ordinary car. So, and, and, and they are about one driver carrying a tiny number of people in a car or a small van. Okay, so like an Uber would qualify then. 
Yeah, like like an Uber. The microtransit folks think that basically a small van that's dynamically routed, um, picking up two or three people and sort of meandering to pick them up and drop them off wherever they are, is some sort of transformation. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more space efficient than a single car, but um, when you start to look at the routing problems involved, it doesn't even do that because um, it's so difficult to actually group a whole bunch of people in a vehicle demand responsibly. No, if you're going to go, if you're going to move people around in a reasonably dense city, you have to be focused on the on the amount of space that's being taken per rider, which is very high. With which, which you know, a van carrying three people is not that much better than a car carrying one person, especially when you count all the time the van has to run around empty. And then you, um, and then also we everyone has to remember, passenger transport operating cost is all is mostly labor cost. And so you, and so until you have level five hands off, don't pay attention automation. Um, the dominant reality is the ratio of passengers to drivers. And so anytime you say, you know, that a bus with 10 people on it is somehow inefficient, it would be better to have those people in three vans with three drivers, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any mathematical sense because the cost of service is the cost of the driver. So some of the ways that Uber and Lyft and, and the microtransit folks have made this appear to be viable is simply by driving wages through the floor, by, by constantly pressing down on, on compensation. But ultimately, um, there's not that much in that, you know, as we can see from the constant news around labor revolts against Uber, they've pushed compensation and benefits as low as they can. And it's not enough to transform the fundamental math. You know, you're not going to be able to pay a driver a third of what a bus driver is paid. You might be able to pay them 30, 40% less, but you'll, and, and then you, then you get what you pay for in terms of quality. So, um, the math doesn't make any sense. What about the, what about the math and the implications of the especially the electric scooters. I feel like those are, in a lot of ways, a game changer, at least for the existing paradigm. I think what the electric scooters mean and electric micromobility in general means, e-bikes as well, is a slight extension of the range of micromobility. By micromobility, again, I mean person-sized vehicles like um, bikes and scooters, extending the range and also potentially extending, expanding the diversity of people who would feel comfortable using them. So people who are perhaps, you know, not as physically fit um, would, you know, might find an e-bike useful who would not necessarily be, be able to ride a, a push bike. So all that's great because what we're doing there is expanding the range of people and the range of trips that can be made in that micro mobility mode where you don't take much more space than your body does. That's entirely a positive for the larger problem of using space in a city efficiently. Have there been any studies to see how much in terms of cars they take off the road? I know a lot of trips in general are less than a mile or two. Right. And vehicles as well. Right. And, and uh, I tend, to, I tend to, to work on this from the geometric side. I'm sure you can find lots of studies about this. And I'm sure that, as always, with a brand new technology, they'll be very inconclusive. Because not just because there isn't enough data, but also because the facts of the matter are always changing so rapidly. Um, whether or not they're getting cars off the road, what they are doing is making more trips possible without taking more space. So what you just what you said was very interesting. If you define the problem as cars off the road, you're you're taking a view that it, you're taking a motorist's view of the problem, because the motorist's view of the problem is that there are cars in front of my car getting in my way, um, and and, and it's an accurate way to describe the congestion problems, that there are too many cars on the road. And it's an accurate way to describe the emissions problem, too. So it, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But there's a different way of, of, define, of talking about this, which is important, which is, the, which is defining it as a freedom problem. So you've probably had the experience, I certainly had the experience, of just not going somewhere and not doing something I wanted to do because the transportation problem was just too difficult. It was just too hard to get there. Right? So... We need to understand that's a loss of freedom and a loss of freedom to do all kinds of things, a loss of freedom to seek the best possible job, the best possible education, just also a loss of freedom to do social and recreational things that give our lives value. And so 
if, if it is possible for people to make trips that they wouldn't otherwise make, to go to lunch a mile away when otherwise they would have felt constrained by what was a block away, that's great. We've created something that is of value to almost everyone, which is the presence of more choices in their lives and more opportunities. But so have airplanes, and airplanes have done a great way of polluting it in the process. So as you extend out those options, you and I could be having this over Skype, or I could be flying out to Portland because I have more freedom. Well, this is interesting, though. With scooters, we with that sort of technology, and not that there aren't a lot of problems to be worked out, but with that sort of technology, it's geometrically possible for a lot of people to get around and, and achieve more freedom without too much negative impact. I mean, obviously, there are all sorts of problems to be worked out, but fundamentally, the key idea is that these things don't take very much space, and therefore, there's room for more of them than there is of cars. Um, the moral problem of, of aviation is very different, and actually, it's an interesting induced demand problem. Um, if aviation were not so cheap, my clients in different parts of the country would not be so insistent that I come there in person and shake hands with them rather than just having a conversation over a video link. So that's another example of induced demand, isn't it? That I am required to do more air travel than I want to because my clients feel I need to be in the room shaking their hand, but they only feel think that's realistic because we've made air travel artificially cheap and therefore are doing too much of it. Yeah, you see some speakers, it's a thousand bucks if it's in my city, it's 10 grand mm -hmm. if I've got to fly somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's putting it's the same much, type of pricing. Much how it is, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, we could definitely use things like that for society. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the future of transportation and the fuel that will be powering it, so to speak. We've got solar, electricity. We have hydrogen. A lot of people are big proponents of that. Right now, we've obviously got combustion engines. Where do you see mm -hmm. us headed in those directions? One of the ways I stay confident is to not comment on things I don't know about. And so um, propulsion is just a territory that isn't my expertise. And there are lots of smarter pe people working on that that I encourage you to ask that about. That is, but geometry is your expertise. And we've got the existing geometric infrastructure for right now uh, combustion engines. Right. I mean, there's the sunk cost fallacies and all of that. And a great deal of sunk what we all know in the in the era of the climate emergency is that people are going to be writing off a lot of sunk costs in the course of the transitions we need to make. Yeah, that would be really great just to have some tax changes where you're writing off things for climate <laughs> impacts. That would be a great way to incentivize companies to change quickly. Mm, that's a good idea. Let's see if the IRS gives a shit. Right now, it doesn't look like it. Um, where do you see us headed in terms of this IoT movement where we are building towards smart cities? We have Google Sidewalk, we have major companies trying to control, survey, improve cities, whatever direction you take that. What direction do you take it? I think the bash backlash against that is pretty well established. Um, and that we're, we're at the time, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of the hype cycle and the way things go through, uh, way inventions go through an inevitable period of, of being wildly exaggerated in their influence, and then experience a crash, and then finally experience a kind of stabilization. If you, if you Google the term hype cycle, you'll find a little graph of this. Um, so we're at the top of the hype, cy hype cycle on Internet of Things. Um, a lot of people are, are, are moving beyond Alexa being convenient and are starting to find Alexa spooky. Um, and and so I think that I think that, again, somewhat beyond my expertise, but I think this is going to shake itself out. Um, the key thing to remember in relation to geometry and in, in relation to what I've been talking about is that Internet of Things, it, it, there is the the hype there is also contains in it the idea that technology will sometimes change geometry. And the, so what you must always be listening for when you're listening to any kind of tech pitch is, is this person suggesting that a geometric fact will be changed by technology? So we see these plans for very dense cities in which everyone gets around in little pods. Doesn't work. Um, it was never going to work. The math doesn't work. There isn't space. This is, by the way, a very old fantasy. You can look up... Um, drawings from the beginning of the automobile age by um, 
an architect named Le Corbusier, who was very influential in the 30s and 40s, and who drew these images of giant modernist towers sitting in parks with miraculously uncongested freeways running between them. Fantastically influential vision of the future that did so much to build the world that we now live in, but mathematically incoherent. The number of people in those units were, would generate far more traffic than he had drawn in his drawings of those freeways. And would also require places to park that he didn't include in those visionary drawings. And so as a result, the vision that he drew of towers sitting in a park with miraculously uncongested freeways has produced what we have instead often when that stuff is built, which is towers sitting in parking lots next to congested freeways. And um, which is a lot of what suburban high density looks like. So we have to constantly notice and train ourselves to notice when we are being sold something that is geometrically impossible. Is that true? And, is that true with modular design, though? So let's say I have tubes shooting around the city, right? And I can pop in and out of the tube, essentially connecting into it. I can have a vehicle, so to speak, driving me around that pops me into public, that pops me back out into private. A system like that feels like it could, and obviously we're utopianized to utopianizing a little bit. We but, are. It's very dangerous. Because the other thing that's going on there is that you're being sold something based on what the experience will be for you. Cars were great when the, in the 1920s when only a few people owned them. No problem. The problem was when everybody owned them. The same kind of problem will arise with, with um, your little pods, right? I mean, the Corbusier image was great, too. The idea of that of those towers with with uncongested freeways, the idea was one person can imagine living in that tower and driving on that freeway and it'll work great until everyone else in the tower drives on the freeway. So with all of those visions, including the visions of pods, you've got to run the numbers on what happens when everybody is using this and does that fit. I still feel like it might, though. So if you had something that was fast enough that you could pop into that you right. were that you were using AI systems to optimize. You could right. you could get on your XYZ spot from over in Oakland. It whizzes you across to, over to San Francisco, two hundred miles an hour. You pop out into the San Francisco city limits somewhere in the center. You drive to your thing, and other people are popping in and out of this system, which functions like a public transit, but that they're riding a scooter type pod. So it is individualized so how big is this pod i mean it wouldn't really matter i can be sitting it's kind of like if i jump into a pool and do a cannonball maybe you double or triple that okay so um you're certainly taking more space than you would take on a crowded train um you may be taking about as much more space than you would take on a bicycle so my point is that's the test there is a purely spatial question which is, are you taking so much space that there isn't room for everyone else? And that's a question you can ask about any technology pitch. You can ask that about Uber. You can ask that about driverless cars. You can ask that about whatever pod thing is proposed next. Um, and the question comes down to, yes, this would be cool, which is what the technology pitch is. Wouldn't it be cool? But then the test is, and how does this work when everybody is doing it? Because that's when you, that's when you get the dystopian outcomes. So without getting into the details of this particular proposal, if it were true that you, this pod was small enough that you uh, weren't taking more space than your body, and if hypothetically you wouldn't feel claustrophobic in that pod that small, um, the, and uh, then it's conceivable uh, that, well, one other thing, if the joining and separating of pods that's necessary to take people from multiple origins and destinations and, and get them all routed, if the space that took was not too much, and that will take a lot of space, um, you know, things moving 200 miles an hour do not just turn abruptly, right? And the space that that takes has to be calculated. And if at the end of all that, it works out that this is still you, an efficient use of space and of energy, then who knows, that might be the future. 
But my rather, but one of the things you'll notice in this interview is I'm refusing to predict the future. But what I am doing is suggesting the questions that need to be asked about pitchers. Like a true futurist. Don't worry, we'll push you on some predictions in the lightning round. <laughs> so, what about flying cars? Does that change the dynamic at all as we add a third dimension? Sure, it's understandable that since we experience the congestion problem of cities, the problem of sharing space in cities seems to be mostly a problem of sharing two-dimensional space, seems to be mostly a problem of sharing the surface. It's understandable that we talk about, well, maybe the solutions in the third dimension. Of course, that's all why, that's why we've always built tunnels ever since we've been building tunnels. Um, but tunnels are incredibly expensive. And so um, it, it raises the question about what we can do in the air. Um, I am... <clears throat> Well, you know what we said about the about the pods running through the tunnel fantasy. It's not just the space that your pod takes. It's also the space. Uh, it's also the pods, if you will, safe stopping distance. Think about a road for a minute. We all know from from our driver training, from when we got our driver's licenses, when we studied the manual, that there's such a thing as safe stopping distance. There's a distance you should follow behind the car in front of you, and that that distance gets bigger at higher speed. Right. At higher speed, you need to allow more space because this safe stopping distance is actually a safe stopping time. So that space we are taking when we uh, that we are not just taking the space our vehicle takes. We are also taking a certain amount of space in front of it, which is the space that needs to be clear. So the same kind of thing is true in more dimensions about aerial vehicles. Right. There's a, they need a lot more separation in all directions. They need a lot more separation below. Um, you need, there, there's a lot more space taken up by reasonable kinds of separation necessary to reduce the likelihood and severity of accidents. And I haven't seen, a count, I am not seeing geometrical analyses of that problem. What I'm seeing in the flying car world is the same pitch we get about everything else, which is, won't this be cool technologically if someone could get into a flying car? That's not the actual problem in cities. The problem in cities is how does it all fit? Mm -hmm. I agree. I feel like we could do pretty well with a geometry just from what I've seen of these drone formations. When people like to give the nice little demos. But of course, it's much easier to do a demo than it is to do it in real life. Notice how many of these technologies, if they fail the geometry test, will ultimately have to be scaled up so that they look more like public transit. Um, Elon Musk, with his tunnel in Los Angeles, you know, tried to pitch it as a tunnel just for cars, which would have fit a ridiculously tiny number of people. It would have served such a tiny number of people that it wasn't remotely relevant to public policy. Um, and so then he tried to scale it up and imagine it as something that some sort of transit vehicle would go through so that more people would benefit from it. Um, you have the fact that whatever you know, single passenger pod thing, flying car thing, whatever kind of thing, tunnel thing, doesn't matter. Um, if it's a car whose defining feature is that you are protected from the company of strangers, that's almost the defining feature of the car, right? It is a space that you control full of only things, things and people that you want to be around. Uh, if that's the defining feature, that's always going to be expensive. That has a higher that has a higher construction cost. It has a higher materials cost. It is taking more space. It is always going to be more expensive. And so, any technology you want to vision will ultimately have to be retooled as more of a transit vehicle. Just as and before long, I suspect flying car technology will turn into something that functions very much like airplanes do, um, which is again, you know, a a a much more space efficient and energy efficient way of doing the same thing. I would agree. I imagine it'll probably be modular. You pop up and hook into a larger flying system. Will the U.S. ever be able to catch up to Europe and other countries that were designed from the ground up to be smaller, more compact, and have much better transit systems currently? Well, there's no point in counseling despair. The U.S. has a very different kind of set of problems. Mm -hmm. um, I would observe that the, that American cities do have some advantages. Um, one is that the grid pattern of so many American cities is wonderfully modular and resilient and very easy to incremental. It is very easy to incrementally improve things 
in a grid structure, a classic grid structure like Chicago or Los Angeles or some city on the prairie. Um, because grids contain an intrinsic resilience that there are many different paths for going somewhere. Um, and they tend to use space very efficiently in terms of the way they route any sort of travel. Um, I have worked on uh, bus network design in a European city in Dublin. And the old medieval street pattern, the twists and turns, the changes of width, the um, you know, even the, the, the tendency for the street pattern to be fundamentally random across most of the city is immensely difficult to work with when you're trying to create any sort of public transport, any sort of transport network of any kind of efficiency. So um, much of what charms us when we go to Europe as, as tourists um, is actually um, very challenging in a lot of ways. And certainly if I were building an ideal city from scratch, um, it would not it would not look like the um, charming narrow twisted streets of of um, Dublin. It would be uh, it would be a relatively gridded pattern. Are we better uh, off building new cities from scratch or retrofitting the ones we have? Um, I think we will do both. Um, my problem right now is that almost all new cities are being built to be car oriented one way or another, and that one of the real harms that I think is being done by a lot of the technological pitches around cars is to sustain the illusion that the car in its basic idea is something that um, will always be possible and will always make sense and will always work. I don't think that's true. Um, the, uh, the, it is, it, that is just mathematically not true about a certain density. We know that's not true. So I think the pitches are doing harm in that respect. But I think we'll be doing both. Um, I think, I think um, I would like to say that America is an environment of unbridled experimentation. But unfortunately, the way conventional development economics work in this country and the way it is all dependent on the judgments of very conservative bankers who mostly approve of things based on the fact that they're familiar means that we actually have incredibly power powerful forces enforcing monotony and lack of innovation. So I think it cuts several ways. You notice I didn't make a prediction. You won't get me to make a prediction, but I can at least talk. I can at least talk through the dimensions of it. I like it. It's uh, if you're going to make the predictions, you got to make them 20 or 30 years out. So by the time they come true or don't, your, your <laughs> career right. is already changed and no one's, yep. no one's thought to think about it. That, by the way, is how infrastructure planning works in America. An enormous amount of it is dependent on 20 year 20 year ridership and traffic predictions that nobody will check 20 years later. Which is incredibly problematic. How do we make the government and areas of public transit more lean startup y so we are able to make change and innovation happen, not on a decade by decade time frame? I think there are a number of dimensions of that. Um, I, the particular dimension of it that I work on is trying to change the, the trying to change the conversation toward relying more on things that we all know, like the fact that large objects don't fit in small containers, or the fact that operating cost, the transport operating cost is mostly labor. And the, if, we had a, if we had conversations based on a shared knowledge of those things, there's a lot less that we would need to analyze. There's a lot less that we'd need to argue about. Um, and I think the conversation would be simpler and therefore faster. Not that it wouldn't still be difficult, not that there still aren't difficult moral questions to work out. Um, I think the, uh, I, I see things being done faster also in countries that have a clearer executive decision process with fewer veto points. Um, our decision process, and it's not just federal, it's also in the structure of even local and regional government. Uh, I think it has too many veto points generally. And as a result, the process of just putting a project together um, is far too heroic than it needs to be. It needs to be routine, and right now it's heroic. So um, I think those are some of the issues. But again, part of the reason why there is so much conflict is that there is so little shared understanding of shared facts. You kind and of, so that's what I work on. You kind of danced around the slippery slope of authoritarianism versus democracy. At least lately, you've seen authoritarianism get a lot more done. 
Do you have any thoughts on what the future holds for government? Well, I, we don't need to talk about authoritarianism, but we can certainly talk about, for example, the difference between the American system and the British derived system that operates in so many other countries, um, including Australia, where I lived and worked for five years. And in that system, there is a government in power and it gets to do things. And there's no real checks and balances system at the, at the national level. Um, the same pattern tends to operate at the level of state and local government, um, state, gov state or um, you know, state government in particular, where um, the party in power at that level is usually the party that is building the transportation infrastructure and making those decisions. So, yes, um, you know, right now in Sydney, for example, a, a, a disastrous um, radial free underground freeway is being built into the city center. Whose, purpose, whose effect is to pump cars into the urban street grid faster than the urban street grid could possibly absorb them. Uh, it's a disaster project. So yes, you can certainly say that that system makes it possible to do disastrous things more efficiently. Um, but on the other hand, it makes it possible to do good things more efficiently. And ultimately on balance, more stuff gets built, more stuff gets done. Um, obviously you can go to the extreme of China, which with those extremely authoritarian powers can build things very rapidly you know, not getting hung up in environmental processes and things like that the way we do. But I think most of us would defend a lot of the reasons that we that we have those processes. So it's difficult. Yeah, it's difficult because if we had the one party rules now or mm -hmm. at least for the last several years, we wouldn't have an EPA. We would be very different. And <laughs> there would be a lot of changes that I'm sure yeah. a lot of the country and wouldn't support. Comparing Comparing with China or Russia is easy. You know, Russia builds, Russia builds stuff really fast, too. Um, it's easy to, to make the sort of radical and extremist comparison to those very authoritarian places. But I think the more interesting comparison is with Britain and with British systems. Well, with Britain, I mean, the more interesting comparison is with, is with truly democratic systems that nevertheless run in the British way, which is that there is, there is someone in, you've, we've elected someone, they're in control, and now they can actually do things. That's the thing that's different. It is, you don't have to imagine authoritarianism to imagine that difference. What city or government has the best transportation system in the world? Obviously, part of this just comes from the shapes of the city. Sure. And pick, um, pick three, because I know you're not going to want to say one. Um, I think there are many. I can think of many cities that are doing very well with their situation. But of course, a transportation system happens in a particular situation. It's part of the identi identity of the city. So I can't really praise a transit system without praising the city, and that becomes very personal and subjective, okay? So I'll put Paris at the top of my list, but I can't separate that from a whole bunch of cultural things about myself and my relationship to France that nobody else should care about. Uh, but it is a very efficient system and a very liberating system in my experience. Um, I think um, several of the East Asian cities, and yeah, I would mention Singapore in particular, in North America, the, the large city that I think is achieving the most in its situation right now is probably Vancouver in Canada. Um, but that has to do, but you know, before you just imagine you can copy that, that has to do with some very unique features of that city, including not just the sort of Hong Kong-like geography where there's very little flat land and therefore very little sprawl, but also the enormous um, Chinese and Hong Kong investment in that city that has turned it into what is in many ways an Asian metropolis, despite the fact that it's physically in North America. So um, uh, I generally am very careful about using this question to imply that other cities should want to like do Paris or do Vancouver, because everybody has to has to solve this in their own situation. Yeah, it's an individual optimization problem without a simple solution. But the geometry is always the same. The opposite mistake can be to claim that, you know, because our city is so special, therefore that geometry stuff you're talking about doesn't apply here. That obviously doesn't make sense either. I want to jump to the lightning rounds now. How's that sound, Jarrett? Lightning rounds? Okay. Yeah, no, you know how, light, no. Lightning round, but I like lightning <laughs> rods as well, as long as no, we're not struck. You know, Matt, you know how evasive I can be. Oh, I know. So listeners, <laughs> you go to disruptors.fm slash Patreon and support us at a level of five bucks or more per month. You unlock this, you get rid of the ads, you get some bonus episodes, and you help us make this sustainable. Disruptors.fm slash Patreon. Let's jump back to the interview itself now. So 
has Elon Musk and Tesla been net good or net bad for the environment and transportation as a whole? Well, when there's a basic fallacy that is running all through the society that people need to confront, it's always helpful to have a gigantic technicolor example, right? So um, there are all sorts of personality problems and behavior problems and um, and moral problems that we can that we can now call Trumpism, and we didn't have that word before, right? And I think I think Elon Musk is doing this a similar kind of favor. Um, now I want to say Elon Musk is is doing so many things at once that I can't really evaluate how good he is at a lot of them. I can only evaluate how he functions in the urban transportation space. And there, in that space, he has made himself a technicolor example of what we call elite projection. You can Google that term, I coined it, the perils of elite projection. And what elite projection is, is the tendency of very, very fortunate, of very fortunate people to assume that what's good for them or what they would enjoy is therefore good for the planet. And so um, there are examples everywhere. Uber is an example, right? People hype up Uber, people invest in Uber to a large extent because they are personally dependent on Uber. Uber has transformed their lives as relatively fortunate, relatively um, upper middle class people who can afford it. And therefore, of course it must be profitable. Of course it must be transformative. Of course it must be great for the world. That doesn't follow, but that's the routine mistake. So Elon Musk's road tunnels, the um, amount of uh, the boring company, the amount of energy that he put into the idea that we should build, we should drill a new kind of tunnel that is smaller and that I can put my car into so that I and an unbelievably tiny number of other people can go faster under Los Angeles. Um, I have no problem, I guess, with a billionaire spending his own billions without getting in anyone else's way in order to create a toy for billionaires. I do have a problem with having presented that as though it's some sort of critique of public transit or as though it's something that somehow transforms uh, urban transportation. Um, and. And as that project has become more and more ridiculous, um, it's, it, and, 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 as a, and as you listen to the way he talks about it, it becomes more and more clear that this project is entirely about his own personal experience of urban transportation as a very fortunate person in, who wants to stay in his nice car. And that's just not most people's experience of transportation. It can't be because that doesn't work, it doesn't fit for everyone. So I, I, I think I, I appreciate Musk for in the in the urban transportation space for uh, I'm thinking specifically of the Boring Company. Uh, I appreciate him for being that sort of technological that sort of technicolor example. Well, I suppose we can call that Muskism if we want to. You don't think about Tesla as well with what they've done with self-driving as being involved in that space at least. Um, Tesla, I, I again I don't have an opinion about the product. I have an opinion about the marketing. Um, Tesla is basically the last company that is seriously hyping the notion that we are anywhere near level five automation, that we are anywhere near that level of automation where the driver actually doesn't need to pay attention, right? Um, I think we know how to do level three, level four automation, and we know how disastrous it is, right? We know how to do the kind of an automation where the, the, where the person in the car still has to pay close attention because they might have to grab the wheel at any moment. We know that doesn't work. It's, it doesn't work with how human beings are. It doesn't work with what naturally distracted animals we are. So it's going to, so driverless cars are going to have to be a heroic jump all the way to level five where they actually don't require our attention. Um, and I think that finally, um, the entire industry is pretty much acknowledging that, except to some extent for Tesla. So um, who knows? Maybe he has a miracle up his sleeve. Maybe he has a miracle up his sleeve. I doubt it. What would you say with the boring company, not necessarily as a critique of that, but you said it as a toy of billionaires. So to play devil's advocate, a lot of times the way technology trickles down, we don't have trickle down economics. We can all argue that. That's very obvious. But the way technology trickles down, trickles down at least is 
you build the you build the toy for the billionaires that becomes the toy for the millionaires that becomes the toy for the high earners becomes the toy of everyone because you have that effect of bringing down those cost curves how do you think about that not necessarily in terms of the boring company but in terms of how we can leverage things like that so tesla has been trying to do that and they've been doing it relatively successfully with electric vehicles obviously we're not where we want to be but that is still a positive step in the right direction the question you must always ask i mean that's fine in a lot of contexts that's fine in a lot of contexts you know somebody invents a new kind of toaster it's very expensive so only rich people have it and then gradually it gets cheaper with scale and then everyone has it happened with microwave ovens you know that's fine um but the problem comes with applying that logic when you're talking about something that consumes a finite resource like urban space, okay? Once we're talking about something that consumes a finite resource, the moral hazard is that as long as only rich people are using it, it will be fine. And then once everyone has it, it will be a disaster. In other words, cars, right? That's how cars work. When only a few billionaires had them, they were just oddities going around and everyone stopped and looked at them and it wasn't much of a problem. And then everyone had them, and then suddenly we had the mess word. So, um, so the, this trickle-down theory is also a, an explanation of how economic and moral disasters occur through technology. Um, you know, plenty of examples of the same principle applying to ecological disasters of various kinds, where you know, a, 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 you know, it was. Nobody particularly cons was particularly concerned about ele elephant poaching when ivory was so rare and only trillionaires could afford it, right? It's when the market scales that all of the ecological disasters start occurring. So you always have to put that theory in the context of the finitude of resources and in the context of urban transportation, the most finite, the most constrained resource is, is just physical space. Do we need regulations to create those types of frameworks because the incentivized and powerful are typically the ones that are able to get what they want and you have to go against their interests for the masses in a lot of instances. The, the irony about regulation is that there's of course a purely libertarian uh, way to approach this, which is by insisting on accurate pricing. And that the distortions that we face and the harms that we're experiencing are the result of inaccurate pricing created by market distortions, created in many cases by government policy. So it's not a question of, you know, the, the regulated state versus freedom. It's a question of regulation being needed to actually, uh, uh, first of all, simply uh, uh, government action being needed to remove market distortions and therefore um, create a market where impacts are accurately priced so that people then uh, are motivated to act in, in awareness of those impacts. So to summarize, the government tried to do something, they did it wrong, and there were unintended consequences. Yes, absolutely. That's how we got to where we are with cars and roads. It was a giant government spending program. Same with healthcare. That's how we get with get where we get to, and education as well. We had the GI Bill. So, uh, Jarrett, I know you've been very generous with your time. I got two last questions for you. The first, what's something I should have asked you about that I didn't? I like asking that question and I hate answering it. Um, I'm sorry, I can't think of one. You've done a great interview, in other words. I'm an AI and this is perfect. So, um, no, <laughs> now, uh, and of course, and of course we're at that level oh, of AI. This was a Turing test. This was a, this Turing. Was a Turing test and I passed. And now <laughs> our last question before you tell people where to find you, what is one thing you'd want to leave people with a quote, a call to action, something we haven't nailed yet, but you think you would want to leave them with. We live together in cities in a spatial world. It's a world defined by geometry. Technology is never going to change the geometry. So we have to learn, for cities to function, we have to learn how to share space. And that's what this is all about. It all comes back to sharing. Sharing is caring and it can be fun. Jarrett, thanks for coming today. Where can people find you and learn more? You can find uh, my blog, humantransit.org. You can find me on Twitter, at humantransit.org. 
My book is called Human Transit, How Clearer Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives from Island Press. Um, and my firm is Jarrett Walker and Associates, jarrettwalker.com.